Hello and let's talk about the state of women's football in India. India has been named the host of the Asian Women's Cup in football, which is scheduled to be held in 2022. Now, this news was greeted with a lot of joy by the footballing community. The All India Football Federation President Praful Patel said that it would, and I quote, galvanize the aspiring women players and bring in a holistic social revolution as far as women's football in the country is concerned. Very impressive words. But what exactly is the state of women's football in the country? Does hosting an event automatically mean that we may be able to take things to the next level in the sport? We talked to Leslie Xavier of the NewsClick Sports Desk to find out. Leslie, thank you so much for joining us. So the Women's Football Asian Tournament is going to be held in India in 2022. India successfully won the bid. Uh, that is, if the tournament takes place, we yes. don't know considering the given, <laughs> given circumstances. But keeping COVID-19 and its uncertainties aside, do you think that, uh, say, bringing the tournament to India will actually revolutionize the sport because that's a kind of claim that both authorities, some players have been making that this is a landmark moment. So is it actually how it's likely to pan out on the ground? So whenever we bid for a major tournament, uh, that's the premise that the entire mechanism works around that this is going to drastically change the way sport is going to be played in the country. So that's the same claim that was there when we bid and hosted the 2010 Commonwealth Games. And we know the legacy of the structures that were erected and all that. Except for the Delhi Metro, I guess, nothing is in proper use. Right. So uh, getting into the specifically the women's game, women's football in the country. And we also have another major event that is happening before the 2022 Asian Cup. That is the Under-17 Women's World Cup, which was supposed to be hosted this year. Uh, in November, it was postponed because of uh, coronavirus outbreak, and it is it will now be held in February March next year. So fingers crossed on that because uh, it's not just about uh, things settling down uh, right. as far as the disease is concerned. It's also about the logistics involved. It's also about mm -hmm. about the kind of money that uh, the stakeholders would be able to pump into the uh, tournament. Right. Anyways, when we bid for that World Cup. Uh, a few years back, uh, we never had anything uh, as far as the women's game is concerned in the country. Mm -hmm. There was no grassroots system in place. And uh, the uh, reasoning that, we, that was given by the All India Football Federation was that with this tournament, there will be things set up. Yeah. Uh, since it's an age group tournament, young girls would be caught in the catchment and uh, a network would be established so that more young girls can come into the game, they can come up through the systems that would be set up uh, subsequently, and uh, we will have a very strong base for women's football in the country, but nothing right. has happened. Right. In fact, the under-17 team uh, was formed as late as last year only. We, till before that, they were, and that, that too after a very appositely conducted selection process across the country. Mm -hmm. There was no two, uh, proper, I mean, I mean, see, when you when you identify footballers and nurture them for the World Cup, we need not right. just one tournament or two tournaments to select mm -hmm. players, right? We need to have a closer look at all the talents that are available across the country. Right. And since there's, in a country like India, where there is no system at all for, for the women's game, it becomes that much paramount that scouts go around so that even locally you might find a talent. Which, who, are, who happen to play really well, but not in the Absolutely. system or not in a collegiate or education. That's where women's game mostly happen, girls' game mostly happen in, in schools and colleges. And beyond that, it dies down. So we bid for the World Cup, we bid for the Asian Cup with, with no system in place for the women to play even. So this is not just the case for the age group uh, girls, but also for the senior women. Mm -hmm. Indian, women's, Indian national women's team hardly play. They played as a team last in the South Games, which was last year. They won. Obviously, South Asia, we are strong. And in the 2002 Asian Cup, we wouldn't have qualified if we were not hosting. So, uh, since 2003, we haven't qualified for the Asian Cup, for yeah. the Continental Championship battle. That shows where we stand as far as women's game is concerned. Yeah. We do have talented players. For instance, Bala Devi is playing in Glasgow right now. Yes, she has signed for Glasgow. Uh, unfortunately, soon after she shifted, the lockdowns happened. So, she hasn't been able to play as much, but she has been training there. And so, obviously, there is talent in the national team setup, despite the system not helping. But 
they hardly get to play and so in the in such a scenario we glorify getting a chance to host a championship where we i mean it, technically if you look at it we don't deserve to be there because uh, quality wise we are not there yet. so so where do you, where, where should the focus be mm-hmm. is it to host a tournament and uh, then after that forget everything or use the, all those resources and the mobilization that happens that it, it's an enormous, enormous logistical process right so why don't why don't use that use that kind of a process to uh, set things up right mm-hmm. before before going before aiming big and before bringing a, bringing a grand tournament into the country right. also could you talk a bit about the domestic scenario as far as women's football is concerned in terms of the possibilities of leagues tournaments and like that there is a national league which was started 3 years back uh, they call it a league but it's a glorified tournament because it just happens for 3 weeks that's the duration and height of summer for instance uh, last year's tournament happened in jalandhar in may if i'm not mistaken yeah it was in may and so imagine north india in may and this uh, woman playing football and that to the fixtures were because there was no flood li- flood lights mm-hmm. available for them the fixtures were held post noon like 3 o'clock and all that so so that's the, that's the kind of treatment that is and so uh, uh, we don't we have a highly publicized men's league the indian super league mm-hmm. none of the teams field a women's team so now there is uh, directives from the uh, aff that all these isl clubs also should start a subsidiary women's team just like across europe everywhere most of the clubs have their women's side and they also have women's league to play for so they don't have any women's programs as such and even in a state like kerala for instance where we are, it's known for producing a lot of women athletes there is there is very little system for football it's changing now uh, gokulam kerala the i i league club they have a women's team in fact they are the champions they are the champions last time the women's league was held and uh, but in that uh, championship winning team i don't think if i'm not mistaken except the manager and one player everyone else was out of state from out, from out from out of the state so that's the so we have pockets we have po- uh, players coming up from the northeast we have some players from goa a uh, couple uh, two three good players from delhi the institutional system here uh, that uh, that brings out a few players beyond that nothing so that's the kind of system that uh, domestic system that india has and uh, it's very clear that a tournament which lasts for three weeks is not enough for anyone to develop themselves and uh, taking into account also that in the national team setup there is no games as such there is no camps as such mm-hmm. when a tournament comes before that if at all possible the camp is held otherwise it doesn't happen and we never we didn't field a team for the asian games last and there was a lot of controversy around that because the indian olympic association said that you guys are not ranked high mm-hmm. enough so we are not right. sending you right. and then they left it at the all india football federation saying that if you want to send the teams both the men's and the women if you want to send the teams you can send it but so we won't fund you you find money from your own packers and aff decided not to send and it's it's absurd to think that the national federation of football which hosts such major leagues and competitions and which has a support from reliance img to not have money to send a bunch of players to right. jakarta to to play football so right. so that's that's more or less the domestic and the national structure as such and Uh, at this point again i just to highlight what exactly the situation is i would like to point out a specific instance of the under 17 women since we started a conversation with the women's world cup under 17 so the camp was disbanded uh, around the time the lockdowns began because it was clear that the tournament would also be postponed and uh, the girls were sent back to, uh, to their hometown so two girls from jharkhand specifically the story came out so they went back and obviously they belong to i mean they belong to a uh, i mean economically backward uh, family so they were struggling to eat even so and news came out in local media there and our, one of our reporters vibhav ragunandani contacted uh, uh, 
the jharkhand football association to understand what exactly the situation is uh, and one of the offi- official from there he spoke to he said that's the that the level of absurdity comes here now that he didn't know the addresses of the girls so they were unable to help them so we are talking about not a district level or a i mean even a state level player as such we are talking about two girls who were supposed to play the world cup uh, at the end of this year and they would hopefully play the world cup next year when it's hosted right. so national team players who, national team world cup play, uh, team players so <laughs> so so that's the so then uh, their intervention happened because hemant soren handles the sports portfolio for the state so he came to know about it he directed the officials to make sure that uh, these two players uh, whatever the needs are it's, it's met post that the all india football uh, federation came forward with their uh, new santiar mechanism working over on overdrive saying that we are gonna meet the dietary requirements of our yeah. under 17 campers for the next two months till lockdown is mm-hmm. over mm-hmm. so it's it's <laughs> it came after after things things were taken care of right so right, right so that's a, that's how ad hoc and that's how uh, reactionary things mm-hmm. work in the country mm-hmm. and uh, hosting major tournaments uh, that's not exactly the answer that that we are looking at if as far as development of the game is concerned on both fronts Absolutely. the men's game as well as the women's game Absolutely. thank you so much lazdeep for talking to us in our next segment we bring you part of a conversation between journalist paranjay guha thakurta and ashok mukherjee who is india's former permanent representative to the united nations in new york they talk about the role of cyberspace governance which is especially relevant at this time when so much of our activity and even day to day life has moved online here is what they had to say more and more people have become dependent on the internet because they've been locked down inside their homes at another level what we see that the hope that the internet had held out some decades ago 20 years ago 30 years ago of being this great democratizing force it would provide information education knowledge perhaps even wisdom it would empower ordinary people but we've come to see the internet being dominated by a few giant global conglomerates who seem to determine what you watch what you hear what you hear uh, what you watch what you see and what you hear why at this juncture post covid is there a need for an international convention on cyberspace well uh, paranjay first of all thank you for having me on your program uh, i have uh, tried in this article that you mentioned to put uh, a proposal uh, in uh, the public domain on an international uh, convention for cyberspace basically because of one reason and that is that uh, while uh, the cyberspace in, includes the internet Uh, has uh, become more visible especially after the pandemic of covid-19 the fact remains that our approach uh, to how this space is being used is very fragmented uh, in the realm of governments the dominating theme uh, is cybersecurity because it's the responsibility of governments to provide security uh, in, including in cyber space and yet Uh, instead of uh, uh, successfully uh, moving towards effective international cooperation uh, to ensure cyber security governments are today caught up in a polarizing sometimes bruising discussion on uh, issues such as who is a threat to cyber security and how do you respond to such a threat to cyber security uh when we look at uh, other players in cyberspace as you mentioned the biggest players are the major multinational corporations uh these corporations have actually grown in the last 15 uh, years uh, because of uh, uh the tremendous uh, progress and strides made by technology and what we today take for granted in the form of smartphones for example was not even conceptualized in 1997 when we agreed to introduce smartphones into our markets so the 
strides in technology are also a, a development and a phenomenon which are today uh, uh, very uh, potentially unknown. Uh, we are hearing, for example, of artificial intelligence and the use of artificial intelligence in cyberspace. So how is this uh, technology going to be harnessed for fulfilling the people-centric potential of cyberspace is an issue which I think needs to be addressed. And then, of course, uh, there are two other uh, players, I would call them in cyberspace. One is academia and the other is civil society. And as far as academia is concerned, they have focused on conceptualizing how cyberspace can develop, how it can grow. But one area where academia has unfortunately not yet been empowered is in providing what we used to call in our uh, education, primary and uh, uh, university education days as the, uh, the, the value-based framework. Uh, you know, we all studied civic science or mo uh, social sciences, etc. But there is, as far as I know, in uh, no country in the world is uh, uh, cyberspace being taught from primary school onwards. And when we talk about uh, the use of education, I think there are two uh, very important areas where this is, uh, has to happen in a more coherent manner. One is in the substance of cyberspace, which includes uh, issues like cybersecurity, how to uh, uh, take care of yourself when you, uh, for the first time, uh, put your finger to the keyboard. But as important is the values and ethics of cyberspace, which actually should be brought into a curriculum for uh, children when they start using this technology. And today's children use this technology very early. Okay. Uh, and of course, the fourth player is civil society. And I think there's a very big role for civil society in cyberspace. It has uh, uh, been played in some countries, especially in Europe and sometimes in the United States. And that role is to ensure that fundamental human rights and freedoms are secured in cyberspace, are upheld in cyberspace. Now, for example, when we talk of uh, the, the concerns of civil society in India, uh, very little of uh, the discussions that, for example, went into the Justice Sri Krishna uh, Committee have even been reflected internationally. So as far as the international community is concerned, they are quite uh, sort of, they have not yet got the full contribution that Indian civil society can make, not only to the Indian discussions, but also to the global discussions. And I come back to it because cyberspace is a global uh, a domain. All right. It, there is no way in which we can uh, uh, put it as the national jurisdiction. That's all we have in this episode of Let's Talk. We'll be back tomorrow with the latest news developments of the day. Until then, keep watching NewsClick.